Grant Zimmer, thank you very much for joining Cell Magazine's Saturday podcast. Um, your life is pretty much uh, evolved around the America's Cup. As a 26-year-old navigator, you uh, navigated uh, Australia to, to uh, America's Cup victory in 1983, and you've been involved with America's Cup more or less ever since. Uh, you have uh, won it uh, four times. You have been on 10 different campaigns, and now you are the CEO of uh, Ineos Britannia. And tell me, how you got there? Okay. Um... Well, actually, I think, and I'm a bit embarrassed by this, but I think it's 12 campaigns now. And uh, I'm no longer the CEO of uh, Ineos Britannia. I was in the last campaign in Auckland, but this campaign, because Ineos is a challenger of record, I've just been dealing with legal issues. And Ben is the CEO of the team, which... Is a little unusual. Ben's both the CEO and skipper of the team, but he is supported um, very well by a guy called Dave Endine, who's the COO of the team. And I'm trying, while I'm here in um, Barcelona with the team, I'm trying to support Dave as much as I can and um, really, really enjoying this campaign because... Um, the team's made a lot of improvements over the last couple of months since they've launched the AC75 and hopefully uh, making a few more this week, you know, as we get into the cup. Mm. You, you are a very versatile person then because you started off as a navigator and then you stayed on with uh, Alan Bog for a while uh, and then became a sailmaker. You were a co-owner of North Sage uh, for quite a long period until you joined uh, Alingi and then you were... Uh, a designer and uh, uh, mostly project involved uh, work um, and then on for different uh, campaigns and now you are involved in legal matters uh, yeah well unfortunately when you've done as many as America's Cup as, as I have you tend to uh, you tend to get involved in some of the legal issues that arise with each cup but uh as you just said, I've had a great career where I've enjoyed a huge amount of sailing, which I love and still love, but also being involved in the design of the boats and the technical development of the boats. As we move from 12 metres into the version five boats and then uh, the big catamaran for a lingi where we did the Dita Gift match in 2010 and then ultimately to the foiling catamarans, which we raced in san francisco with oracle and um and now since the boat we had in auckland and this current Ineos britannia boat fantastic mono falling monohulls it's a huge uh, transition from the 12 meters um, to this type of boat but uh, take us through it a bit uh, starting with uh, the 1983 america's cup well yeah, well, the, the 1983 America's Cup with Australia too, you know, and a 12-metre yacht really only goes upwind at about eight and a half knots and it doesn't really go a lot faster downwind. And it weighs a lot, you know, 25 tonne or so. It's quite a heavy boat. Um, but you still had a lot of good racing. But the races were, the legs were five miles long. So there were... You know, the time limit for the America's Cup racing in 83 was five hours. In the modern world today, uh, the leg length is only about a mile and the boats are doing 40 knots upwind, not eight knots, 40 knots upwind. Um, and the time limit, well, I mean, the, the race is scheduled to take 27 minutes. So when Ian Murray is adjusting the length of the courses, He's always doing that to try and finish the race within 27 minutes. So it's a very, very different world from what we had uh, in 1983. Probably the most consistent thing is that the America's Cup is won by typically the fastest boat, but also the best sailed boat. So 
it's a, you know it's great that it's a technical and a sporting contest. Right, but do you think that now the speed is um, compromising the match racing aspect of it? No, no, not at all. I think the starts are going to be actually more important because they're shorter racing and because the racing is uh, limited by the boundaries. The start is really critical. And um, even though we didn't see many passes in the final, uh, I think... I think we're going to see that in the match. I hope we see that in the match. More close racing, probably a few passes, both on the upwind and downwind legs. So it's a different form of match racing, but the racing skills are just as important as they were 40 years ago. I guess that we know more about the various boats now than we used to before, because it was much secret about the keels and everything, and you wouldn't, you, you wouldn't have sailed against the defender before the America's Cup races itself. Now, the defender has been uh, on for quite a while. He's been participating in the preliminary series of the Louis Vuitton Cup. Um, it's uh, it's quite a different thing. It is. Uh, for many cup cycles now, we've stopped the boats being um, skirted, you know, shrouding. So we can see, and we have people photographing the Team New Zealand boat every day. So we know lots of features on that boat. Um, and we sailed, they sailed in the round robin part of the Louis Vuitton. So we've sailed against them in several races. So we know about their performance. But if you look at our performance, Ineos Britannia's performance since the round robin, we've improved dramatically. Um, we're much faster and we're sailing the boat much better now than we were in the round robins. And that's been one of the great things about this team, how that they've continued to learn and continued to improve. So the question is, and the unknown is, how much has Team New Zealand improved since those round robins to the match? And we're really not going to know that decision till we get into a couple of races in, a, in varying conditions. Mm. Uh, somebody said to me that uh, Grant Dalton had uh, told him that uh, the team that he feared the most actually was Ineos' team uh, even before these latest improvements. And that was because your association with Mercedes and uh, your ability to um, catch on to their uh, uh, aerodynamic uh, uh, you know, um, competence. Yeah. Uh, I mean... Uh, the, the relationship between the sailing team and Mercedes Formula One team is very strong. Mercedes Formula One have been completely involved in the design of the boat from the from the inception of this boat, and that includes um, aerodynamic modelling and hydrodynamic modelling using a series of CFD codes at all different levels. Um, with, with CFD, you can use low resolution and high resolution tools. And um, the guys at Mercedes have been instrumental in helping the yacht designers, particularly Martin Fisher, in terms of what tools to use at each stages throughout the design of the boat. Um, and the other thing that Mercedes have been really good at is helping us develop the systems on the boat, the electronics and hydraulics that control both the aerodynamic package and the hydro packages. Mm. Um, you are both a designer and a sailmaker, so you have had the chance to influence uh, both. How much have that actually happened? I, well, I have to say again, I haven't had much influence over the designer well, really any influence over the design of this boat, but uh, I've been involved in a lot of cup boats over the years, good and bad, and um, it's one area that I, I really enjoy. And you've got to get the aero package correct, and our designers, I think our sail design have done an excellent job with our aero package. But... Um, the hydro package in these boats, the foils, how the foils operate throughout the speed range is absolutely critical to the performance of the boat. 
but they all have a similar set of forks. So all the uh, AC seventy fives. Not really. I mean, the the span of the main falls is similar. Is sort of we're at the maximum allowed in the rule, and that's one of the changes since Auckland. We've increased the span fifteen percent, and that's allowed the boats to fly at a lower speed. And by increasing the aspect ratio of the foils, we've got lower drag on the foils. But there's a lot of difference in the shape of the foils and how the foils to form and what the falls look like in their deformed shape because they're carrying a lot of weight on these really thin, long foils. So you can imagine what happens to the falls. Do they twist when they deform? What are the flap, you know, what's the distribution of the flap loading uh, throughout the speed range? There's a whole lot of things that the designers have worked on and there's significant differences between our falls and the Kiwi falls. But the mast profile is identical, and probably yes, the mast profile is identical. Mm. Um, you're allowed. There's a minimum laminate on the mast, but you're allowed to be stiffer than that and add laminate in certain areas, which we believe the Kiwis have done. Um, you've got a limited amount. You can change the amount the mast twists with the laminate design. Um, but mass rotation is clearly a very important part of setting up your mainsails. <laughs> We've got the two-ply mainsail, which is uh, uh, something that's been developed for this class of boat rather than going with a solid wing like we had in the AC-50s and the AC-72s. And the two-ply mainsail has been... Um, it's been quite a good development. Um, it was introduced by the Kiwis, by, by their sail designer, and it allows us to vary the loading both vertically, you know, mostly vertically in the mainsail, and then reduce drag when we're going at high speeds, particularly upwind. Mm. So tell, me about, tell me about the jibs, because there is a lot of variables on the jib size that you can choose. Yeah, and the boats are really sensitive to it really sensitive to the amount of area you have in the jib. So it changes the size of the jib will change the loading on the mainsail and that changes the balance of the boat and how much load that you have on the rudder, which is critical because these rudders are tiny. And so we carry, we don't carry a lot of side load on the rudder. We want to try and carry it all on the foils. Um, but it's like these boats are like catamarans. So you get to a maximum riding moment very quickly once the boat's falling. And once the boat's falling to get it accelerating, um, you need to lower the center of effort in the sail plan and, and increase the force generated in the sail plan. I mean, you can't, you don't want to increase the, um, uh, the healing moment in the sail plan. So you've got to lower the center of effort. And that's why these jibs start to look terribly low aspect uh, and we go to a low aspect jib very quickly. The other thing that's important is sealing the sail plan against the platform, against the uh, against the hull. So the sails, are, the mainsail and the jibs have got to be sealed against the deck of the hull, the platform. And we still, and then we generate this big vortex that wraps itself around the hull. But that's why the boats have a bustle and um, and then we have a little end plate on the bottom to try to break that vortex up. Um, does the ch uh, choice of um, jibs, is that influenced not only by the wind, but, uh, but by the uh, waves as well? A little bit, but more by the wind strength. It's a trade-off between upwind and downwind. There's slightly bigger jib is often better downwind but slower upwind so the guys have got to trade and if the if it's gusty and you've got to sail through uh, lulls then then that'll affect your the jib decision as well do you actually ease the jib a bit in the lurch uh a little but again it's really the balance of how it works together with the mainsail 
So you don't want to be, uh, if the boat gets out of balance, you may want to ease the jib a little bit. Mm. Uh, I cannot stop thinking about the history of uh, your participation in the America's Cup and, and of course, winning it in 1983 must have been quite uh, fabulous, uh, taking it away from New York Yacht Club and being the first foreign countries to um, to win the America's Cup. Uh, is it any possibility to compare the 83 Cup with 2024 Cup? Uh, um, well, we're hoping or, and we're thinking that it could be very close. So the 1983 Cup was the first best of seven, so first to win four races. And, and as you know, it went to 3-3, and then the last race was a decider. Mm. Uh, I I hope that this cup will be close too. I mean, the sailors probably don't want the stress, but I think it's really good for the event that it's a close event. Mm. So that is potentially one similarity where where I think that the boats will be quite close in performance and hence the sailors will win and lose some races and the best team will come out first to win seven races. Mm. You um, were down 1-3 uh, in 1983 and, and uh, Ben Ainsley has been down 1-8 uh, uh, when he was a tactician for Jimmy Spitty uh, in San Francisco. So uh, you know that um, it's possible to come from behind. Yeah, yeah, I was the manager of that team in San Francisco, so was working with Jimmy and Ben, and uh, that was an interesting. We just kept improving the boat all the way, even through the America's Cup series. So that's why the performance changed so much during during the season. And we were able to foil upwind, and um, able to do a falling tack, uh, and the. New Zealand boat wasn't able to do that for several reasons linked to their design. Mm. I'm not going to ask you whom you think is going to win the cup because I think that is pretty difficult to predict. But uh, there are certain aspects. Uh, I, I would say that Team New Zealand uh, probably um, have some edge in starting earlier and uh, preparing uh, this race with intimate knowledge about the rule, which they participated in creating themselves. On the other hand, uh, Ineos um, have uh, sharpened their sailing through the Louis Vuitton Cup, which I think would be an advantage. How do you weigh these things against each other? Oh, that's a, that's a very big question. Um, I, I think our racing skills have improved dramatically. Um, and that's not that, you know, Ben Ainsley's probably the most successful sailing sailor in the history of our sport. But what's in, what is why has he been able to improve the racing of the boat? It's because the boat's performance has improved and then the sailors have more confidence in their equipment and then they sail with more confidence as the equipment gets better. It's not that Ben's become a better sailor. He's already at the very top of our sport, uh, Ben and Dylan. It's just that they've got more confidence with the boat. Um, in terms of developing the rule, because this team, Ineos Britannia, is a challenger of record, we had to agree the rule with the Kiwis. So we've been involved all along with the development uh, of the rule. So we we probably matching them in terms of our knowledge of the rule the same as the Kiwis. Um, the strength of the Kiwis is that they've got a very established team in all aspects from Grant Dalton down. They're guys that have done the Cup many times before. Their head designer, Dan Bernasconi, is, um, has done several Cups and is a real leader in um, uh, modelling the behaviour of sailing yachts and is selling... Um, well, it has developed performance prediction tools and a simulator, which is probably the gold standard in, in our world of falling yachts. Uh, so that's a real strength that they've got. But on the other hand, we've got Mercedes with us, which bring a lot of resources to bear at the design problems. 
Grant Simmer. Rambling answer. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> are you? Uh, are you? So is this something that you would like to say at the end? Oh no, I I just think I I hope we have a close close cup, and I hope that people really enjoy watching the racing and appreciating the skills of the sailing teams on both boats. Mm. I love to watch and listen to the communication on board the boat between, um, say, Ben and Dylan or um, Jimmy and Checo on the Italian boat. I love to watch that they can race boats that are ripping around at the mid-40 knots and they're talking like they're racing a, a boat sailing at eight or nine knots, you know. So that, for me, has been... I just I really enjoy watching the racing, even though it can be incredibly stressful. Mm. Grant Samer, thank you very much for joining Side Magazine and uh, good luck with uh, the America's Cup. Thank you. See you later.